the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 24. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. A Sunday school. <laughs> we need to get adjusted. It's okay. It's all good. A Sunday school uh, teacher asked her young students the following question. Where is God? That's a good doctrinal question to ask students. And a little girl raised her hand real enthusiastically and said, God is in heaven. And the teacher acknowledged that answer and validated that answer. And another little boy raised his hand. And she called on him. And he said, God is in my bathroom at home. <laughs> and she said, can you explain what you mean? He said, yeah, every morning my father stands outside our bathroom door. And he says, my God, are you still in there? <laughs> I want to tell you this morning where God is. God is on a mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus tells us this beautiful long parable. Some people view it as three parables, some as one long parable. But Jesus is reminding us God is on a mission, and his mission is to seek lost humanity. 
See, friends, we are all lost. Adam and Eve's sins has severed us, severed our relationship with God. And God loves us so much that he took the initiative to reconcile us to himself by granting to us the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so many people, they think the Bible is a story of God trying to, of man trying to reach God. It's not. It's the other way around. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. God is still looking for humanity. I thank God he came looking for me. I thank God he came looking for you. That's the story of the Bible. Where is God? God is on a mission, seeking to save us. I thank God that we're here. I pray that we would open up our hearts and allow the God to come in because he wants to save us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to restore us. He wants to renew us. The prophet Isaiah, in speaking to Israel, in chapter 59 and verse 1, God, uh, uh, Isaiah reminds the people, God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Isaiah was trying to tell backslidden Israel, hey, God is seeking you out. Even though you're backslidden, God is reaching out to you. And God will listen to you if you reach out to him. But in verse 2, you know what Isaiah says to Israel? But your sin has separated you from God. And that's what, God, that's what sin does. It alienates us and it separates us from God. And the wonderful principle and story of the Bible is that even in the midst of our sin, God comes looking for us. In, in, in Genesis 3, 9, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God. And the Bible says, God said, where art thee? Where art thou? God can't stay away from sinful humanity. Where is God? God is looking for us. It is God who initiated the plan of salvation. The whole theme of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 4 all the way through Revelation 22, is God is looking for lost mankind. God is actively seeking us to forgive us, to restore us. That's his mission. Where is God? He's seeking lost humanity. He's seeking you and I. In Luke chapter 15, we see it's the lost and found chapter of the Bible. In the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, we get a wonderful, wonderful picture uh, and a glimpse of who God is. God loves his creation. He can't stay away from us. What is he doing? He's on a mission, seeking to save us. Uh, that's the whole theme of the parable here. Uh, and, and I pray that we would open up our hearts to us. In the first story, we see, again, God's love for sinners. The shepherd represents God here. The shepherd represents Jesus. All of us, uh, all of us, we are lost sheep. And, and, and one sheep out of the fold, God is concerned about that one sheep. Why? Because that one sheep is precious to him. The shepherd does not rest until that lost sheep is found. It doesn't matter why it was lost, how it was lost. Every sheep is precious to the shepherd. We are precious to God. God has a plan and God has a purpose for us. Every soul is precious to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You could put your name in there. God so loved you that he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to come and die for us so we can be reconciled with the Father. We are the apex of creation. We are precious to God. We are valuable to God. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 and 28, we see that we are created in the image and in the likeness of God. This corresponds and, and, and like this, uh, it gives us human life a sacredness, a worth, a dignity, an honor, and value. It do, that doesn't belong to the animals. It belongs to us. God breathed a part of himself into us, his eternalness, eternalness into us. God breathed his DNA into us. What a privilege and an honor for us to be reconciled 
with our Heavenly Father. In Psalm 8, verse 5, it says, we've been crowned with glory and majesty. Friends, what is the Bible saying? God is interested in us. God is interested in our welfare. God is interested in our hurt. God is interested in our fear. God is interested in our loneliness. And he comes to us in the person of Jesus and in the person of God, the Holy Spirit, to help us, to comfort us, so we can be reconciled uh, to Almighty God. No matter how tedious the search, how great the obstacles, how dangerous it was for the shepherd, the shepherd went out in law and found that lost sheep. It doesn't matter if the sheep were dirty. It doesn't matter if the sheep were sick or were weary. The shepherd picks them up. Jesus tells us this beautiful story. The shepherd picks us up. Lord, the Lord loves us personally and individually. I had an opportunity years ago to visit the catacombs in Rome, Italy, and on the walls are drawing and sketches of Jesus as the great shepherd. And sometimes in the drawing, he's carrying a lamb in his arms or a lamb around his shoulder. That's just like our shepherd. That's what he desires to do. Jesus is a compassionate shepherd. He's a caring shepherd. He is a merciful shepherd. The early Christians were persecuted. Some of them suffered. Some of them were martyred. Yet knowing that the Lord Jesus was their shepherd brought great comfort to them that Jesus is our loving, caring shepherd. Jesus tells this story, by the way, in response to the Pharisees. The Pharisees accused Jesus of associating with sinners. And the apps, Jesus loves the sinners. Jesus loves humanity. Jesus loves all of us. Are you with me? The religious leaders, they felt that they were defiling themselves by associating with sinners, not Jesus. Jesus loves all of humanity. I want to remind this, friend, God is no respecter of persons. While we may look at the outside or the appearance of people, God looks at the soul. God is no respecter of person. In Luke 19.10, we get Christ's mission statement. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. The heartbeat of God is missions. Are you with me? Christ's last commandment is for us, will be our first priority to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. I thank God that God cares about us. I pray that the Lord would, even as we, uh, Danette just said a couple minutes ago, would just stir our hearts for the lost, individually, corporately. The Bible says that God wishes none would perish. And as we read this wonderful story, these parables here of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, may it just renew our burden and our passion to reach the lost, to reach our families to reach our neighbors, to reach our community. In the next couple of weeks, it's going to be our missions convention. Our emphasis will be on home missions and foreign missions. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. May we be re-energized to do that, all of us. The story of the lost coin, the second parable, contains a very similar truth. Something precious was lost. The woman lit a candle and searched for this missing coin that she lost within her house. And the light represents the Lord Jesus. It represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, and again, we see God takes the initiative uh, to seek, to find, to rescue lost humanity. That's what he's doing with us. If you're here today, friends, you say, oh, I just happened to be here. Someone invited me. I want to tell you, friends, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He wants to remind you that he wants to bring you into the fold. Amen. He wants to love on you and to give you peace and to give you forgiveness. Amen. The Palestinian woman, they received 10 silver coins as a wedding gift. Besides having monetary value, it was, had sentimental value. It was almost like a wedding ring. It was very, very valuable, very precious to them. And the loss of a coin was almost like an embarrassment. They didn't want to do that. And what silver, what that silver coin is to the woman, what is Jesus saying here? As precious as that coin was to that woman, you and I are precious to God. 
That's what the Lord is trying to teach us here in, in these parables. We are precious to God. He will seek and search till we're found. Amen. Till we are rescued. And by the way, the coin was lost in the house. You know, years ago, I preached a message. Are you lost in the house? Well, what do I mean by that? You can be in God's house, but your heart, you can be physically present, but spiritually you're lost. Friend, God has a plan and a purpose for us. Amen. Amen. We can be lost in the house, and it tells us that this woman, she had to light a candle to search for the lost coin. That's Jesus. He comes looking for us. You know, the apostle Paul founded the church in Corinth. Paul loved the church, like, like pastors loved their flock. He loved the people. And yet he realized there were people in the church that were not converted. They were not Christians. And when he writes a letter to them, he describes three different classes of people. He talks about the spiritual person, and he lists some of the qualities. Then he talks about the carnal people in the church. There were some people in the church, they had one foot with Jesus and another foot in the grave. And he exhorts them <clears throat> to follow the Jesus and to commit themselves to Jesus. But he also talked about the natural person. He realized there were some people within the church that had yet not been converted. They had not given their hearts to the Lord. And I encourage us to examine ourselves. By the way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 5, when Paul concludes both letters, you know what he asked the church? He said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. You know, friends, even the devils believe it's not merely head knowledge. You can know John 3, 16, but not serve the Lord. And so the apostle Paul was concerned for those in, in the church. We could be in the house, but not in the faith. You know, just this past week, I, uh, I took the offering to, uh, to the, the bank for the bank deposit, and the teller, when I gave her the deposit, and she was counting the money, she said, are you the pastor at the church? I said, yes, I am. She said, well, you know, I grew up in the faith, and I spent a lot of time in church and all, but it wasn't until last year that I gave my heart to the Lord. It's a confirmation that sometimes we could be in the house, but we're lost in the house. By the way, I asked her, what is your favorite scripture? She says, I don't have any. I gave her two scriptures, Philippians 1.6 and Philippians 4.13. Come on now. Hey. <laughs> By the way, can I digress just for a minute? Um, a couple Wednesday nights ago, I asked Brother Carlos to pray, and he was telling us about how he memorizes scripture, that uh, he memorized the whole eighth chapter. Uh, I often share that with others. If they're going through something, I tell them to read Romans 8. But as he was praying, I was standing here, and an illustration came to mind as he was praying, and that is memorizing scripture is like having money in your wallet. When you need that money, you take it out of your wallet or out of your purse, and you purchase whatever you need to purchase. That's like Scripture. When you memorize Scripture and you have it in your heart, when you need it, it'll come out. When you need comfort, it'll come out. When you need encouragement, it'll come out. When you need it to prevent you from sinning, it'll come out. David said in Psalm 119, verse 9, he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So I encourage us to memorize scripture. All right, I'm going to move on. The third story. Let's get to the third story. The lost son, we see the greatness of God's love toward lost humanity, toward the backslider. The father in this story represents God. The father is watching. He's waiting for his son to return. 
the story illustrates for us the love of God toward humanity. It's an object lesson of God's heart. Friends, if you ever want to know what is God, what is the nature of God, read this parable. God's love is real. God's love is personal. God's love is unprecedented. God's love is transformational. Amen. Amen. God, 1 John 3, 1, uh, uh, the, the, the apostle John said, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Amen. How powerful is God's love. It is so essential for us to understand, mandatory for us to understand God's love. And, the, and this last story here begins with the youngest son. He's asking his father for his inheritance. Basically, he's saying, God, Dad, I don't want to wait for you to die. I, I want my inheritance now. I want it now. I, I'm no longer content being here. You know, I'm tired of the routine. You know, oh, my. You know what he's saying? You know, Dad, there's nothing exciting happening here. I want my money. I want to go and party. I want to have a good time. I want to do my own thing. Have you ever heard that before? I want to do my own thing. Just give me my money and give it to me now. By the way, according to Deuteronomy 21, 17, the younger brother's share was one-third of the father's estate, which was a large sum, one-third of his resources, a large sum of money. And though the father, who represents God the father, was saddened, he, he was heartbroken, you know what, he gives the son is request. And the Bible tells us the son went into a foreign country. Oh, man, he wanted to get away. He wasn't going to stay near his farm, near the farm or his father. He's going to get as far away as possible. And little by little, you know what began to happen? He started blowing and wasting his inheritance opulent living. He's living like a big child here. The best chariot, the best hotel, the best restaurants. He's not buying his clothes at Walmart or Kmart here. No, no. This guy's blowing his money. Wine, woman, song. It's pleasure. It's fun. You know, you know what, friends? The Bible says sin is only for a season. Yes. You know, as Americans, we love our novelties. You ever notice as Americans, we go from one thing to another novelty to another, and you know what? We're still empty on the inside. Still empty on the inside. I thank God for the grace and the favor, how he fills that void. But I want to tell you, after a while, see this kid with all his money? After a while, he's busted. The inheritance is gone. He's bankrupt. No resources, no capital. I want to tell you, you can waste in one month, one month what you've accumulated in 10 years. He blew it. He blew it all. And the complicated matter is there's a severe famine in the land where he's at. There is no family. There is no friends. In verse 16, in Jesus telling this story, there's nobody there to help him. You know, and yet he had everything at his father's farm. Family, friends, food, dignity. He had self-respect. He had security. But it's all gone. What a terrible decision he's made. And for the first time in his life, he's lonely. And there's nobody there to help him. How, what a sad, disheartening story. And in order to survive, there's such a, a famine in the land, he's got to settle for feeding pigs. And his food is pig food, basically. That's his pay. By the way, in Jewish culture, our Jewish friends, pigs are considered unclean. Even today, many of our Jewish friends, they will not eat pork. Uh, it carries parasites. That's another issue. But in the Old Testament, a, a hog it was considered unclean. Here this guy is living and eating with pigs. How degrading. Uh, how degrading and humiliating for this guy. And yet he's the son of a wealthy, influential farmer. He's living in a pig pen, eating with pigs. Oh, my. He's lost everything. How tragic. He's probably fearful. He's probably anxious. How often this happens in our day and age where people just want to do their thing and they blow their money and yet they're left with nothing. Now keep in mind in this story, the father represents God. The son represents sinful humanity, the backslider. There are consequences to sin. Are you with me? 
You know, whatever we sow, we reap. Sin is costly. Sin is destructive. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. You say, I don't want to go so far with sin. No, 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 no. It never stops. You say, but I'm only going to spend $1,000 on my sin. No, 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 no. It only begins there. It will cost you a lot more than what you expect to pay. Are you with me? Amen. And you'll stay there a lot longer than you wanted to stay. That's exactly what happened with him. This story is universal. In some degree, it's repeated over and over again. The, and by the way, the far country, it's not always another country that you go to. It's not necessarily a location or a place or a hideout. You know what the far country is? When you alienate yourself from God. Where you say, I'm going to do it on my own without God. I don't need God. I'm going to do this on my own. It's rejecting God. It's rejecting the will of God. It's when your heart, your soul becomes dark and it becomes callous toward God, toward the Bible. You know, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remember in that, in, in that analogy in John 15? He said, without me, you're nothing. Without me, you're not, the far country is detachment from God. It's detachment from the vine. Friends, we are not independently righteous. We are not independently holy. The danger is that and I've seen it over and over. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. Once we had a relationship with God, once we had a knowledge of God, we were serving God, and little by little we began to drift. We have to be really, really, really careful, friends, of drifting away from God. Very, very, very careful of drifting. You remember Samson in the Old Testament. He continually to embrace sin. He didn't realize after a while his strength was gone, his power was gone. I want to tell you, you know what happens? Sin, it begins to erode our faith. And it's so subtle. After a while, you say, what happened? Where, where am I at? Where, what's happened to me? The good news here is the prodigal son had a change of heart. He reasons with himself, and he's talking to himself. He's, been, he's saying, basically, if I can paraphrase, what a terrible mistake I've made. The Bible says his senses, you know, the, the, light, the light came on. I love to see when the light comes on. We realize, what am I doing? It's empty. I'm lost. I need God. Friends, when you have that attitude, God will come running to you. Amen. Amen. The light came on. Praise God. I love when the light comes on. People can change. Amen. God can deliver us. God can change us. God can transform us. Amen. Parents, keep praying. Wives, keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. God loves the backslider. In Jeremiah 3.14, it says God is married to the backslider. Talking about Israel. You know what? I want to tell you something, friends. Sometimes people need a pig pen experience for the light to come on. If they're there, you keep praying. Don't, don't get them out of the pig pen. You leave them in there till the light comes on. You remember there was a man in the Corinthian church sleeping with his stepmother. Paul said, kick him out. Let the devils lump him up till he comes to his senses. Then restore him. Keep praying. God is able. Are you with me? God is able. I want to tell you, what we don't learn through love and precept, we have to learn by experience. Sometimes experience is the best teacher. When you're in the muck and the mire, I thank God will come. God will come and get us out of that. Sometimes people have to get there, and so we, we, we pray and we leave them in there. Are you with me? Amen. Uh, you know, the prodigal, he's... he's He's talking to himself. Hey, man, what, what's going on? What did I do? I have no rest, no joy, no food, no shelter. And he begins to reason with himself, and he said, my father's servants are better off than I am, and I'm the son. So the light is coming on. He's probably homesick, hungry, probably lost 20, 30 pounds. Oh, probably stinks. Man, oh, man. Could you imagine how he's living with the pigs? And you know, he makes a decision to go home to be a servant. 
you know what he says? I love what he says, man. He said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Friend, you want something from God, acknowledge your sinnership, that you've sinned from God. Sin is never justifiable, but it's always forgivable. God responds to the hungry heart. God responds to the meek. Not the arrogant or the proudful. Oh, man. The Bible says God resists the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know what? The prodigal son, he humbled himself. Isn't that wonderful? He's humbling himself, and he's preparing what he's going to say to dad. He said, dad, I'm sorry. I blew it. And as he begins his journey home, by the way, the prodigal knows, oh, hallelujah, woo. The prodigal knows his way home. Come on, someone say amen. amen. You keep praying. He knows his way home. Amen. You keep praying. You keep praying. He knows where to come back. He knows how to come back. You keep praying. Amen. He knows the road to his father's house. And the dad sees him. The father is waiting. He's watching for him to come back. Amen. I don't know how long he was away, but the father was watching. God's love is supernatural. It's real. Hallelujah. Amen. The father runs out to meet him. Oh, man. You imagine the father running out with his brother. My son is home. My son is home. Amen. That's God. It's a picture of God. He loves us. He loves humanity. He loves the backslider. He welcomes the backslider. Amen. Probably blown up his robe, huffing and puffing, crying and weeping. My son, my son, my son is home. Amen. What a picture of love and compassion and forgiveness from God the Father. Friends, the Father in this story represents God. By the way, this is the only place in the Bible where we see God running. But you know what? He's searching and running after us. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on now. Hallelujah. He loves humanity. He loves humanity. He wants to restore us, not to condemn us and judge us, but to restore us and to forgive us. Amen. By the way, I, I gleaned the message. I titled it, The Son Walked, The Father Ran. That's where I got the message, the title of the message. It says the son walked home, but when the father saw him, he ran after him. Oh, come on. Oh, isn't that a beautiful picture of God? That's God. That's God. God is more ready to forgive than we are to repent. God is more ready to receive us than we are to return. God is more ready to give us life than what we ask. Amen. Hallelujah. Friends, the Bible says if we draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to us. When we move toward God, he, he's waiting. He's watching. His goal is to restore us. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, isn't it wonderful when the Father embraces us? Oh, man. I want to tell you, friends, <laughs> I was 26 when the Lord saved me. If somebody would have told me I was going to hell, I would have laughed at him. You know what changed me is the love of God. Transformed my heart and my life, man. Never been the same. Hallelujah. Thank God for his great love. When the Father reaches him, the Father, the Father embraces him. The Father begins to kiss him. Hallelujah. Come on now. Lots of kissing. Forget about the speech. The son had a speech. He was going to say, you know, Dad, I blew it. I... No, no, forget about the speech. The father loved him. The father restored. Amen. The past was forgiven. What a wonderful picture of restoration and forgiveness. Thank God for the prodigal son coming home. Amen. If you're here today and you're a prodigal, the father is waiting for you to come. He's waiting. He's crying. He wants to embrace you. He wants to love you. Amen. I want to tell you, friends, the hero in this story is not the son. It's God. It's God's love and compassion for us. Thank God for his mercy. He's the hero in this story. It's his loving, gracious, patient father. Amen. Hallelujah. By the way, there's no statue of limitations to repent. You are always welcome. Amen. Amen. What is God? Who is God? It's right here, friends. Jesus is telling us who God is so we can understand. Some of the doctrinal statements are hard for us to understand. Omnipotence, omniscience, some of those words. But here, the, 
Jesus is telling us who the Father is. This is a wonderful picture of God. You say about Tony, you know what? I did some nasty things. I did some awful things. I understand. I've been there. You say, Tony, I, I, I sinned against my family. I did some terrible things with my body. I've been living apart from God. Is there forgiveness? Oh, yeah, there's forgiveness, friends. That's what our Lord is teaching us here. He's teaching us God is merciful. He's teaching us God is gracious. He's teaching us the Lord wants to forgive us. The Lord wants to restore us. The Lord wants to heal us. He desires to embrace us. He desires to kiss us. The greatest experience you'll ever experience in this life, friends, is the Lord embracing you and kissing you and loving you. The fear is gone. The guilt is gone. The condemnation is gone. The Lord restores. Amen. He mends. He heals. And the story tells us the joy of restoration. The father tells his servants, hey, find the best robe. My kid is home. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. The father is saying, I'm going to make a feast. I'm going to make a celebration. I want everybody to know. I want the whole neighborhood to know. I want the whole country to know my son is home. Amen. My son is home. My son is home. Get that best calf. calf. Get that blue ribbon calf out there. We're going to make barbecue lamb chops tonight. My son is home. Amen. Friends, I want to tell you, God restores you know, sometimes as humans, we put limits and we have all these guidelines. Oh, friends, God restores. Oh, he restores. What is it, Joel 2.25, I think, God restores to us the years that the locusts have eaten. Trying to tell Israel, no matter what has happened, God desires, I want to restore. Notice the five signs of the Father's love. The kiss, it's a sign of pardon. It's a sign of forgiveness. Number two, the robe. He said, get the best robe. It's a sign of honor. It's a sign of dignity. The ring, it's a sign of authority. It's a sign of privilege. The sandals, it's a sign of freedom. The slaves went barefoot. We were going to put sandals in his feet. And the feast was a sign of acceptance, a joyful restoration of welcome, of renewal. How much the Lord loves us, he loves us. Amen. Amen. You know, I had a thought <laughs> this week as I was preparing. <laughs> the father loved him so much that he let him go. Did you get that? But he proved his greater love by receiving him back. Amen. When the kid asked for his inheritance, the father didn't even argue. If that's what you want, you go ahead and do it. Let him go into that pig pen. Let the light come on. Because I think when this kid came back, he came back changed. Uh, there's another story, the older brother. That's another story. We'll go there another time. But you know what, friends, the Lord is reminding us today. He's been waiting for you. It's time to repent. It's time to serve the Lord. You know, I just, just yesterday, I mentioned that to somebody. It was a family member. We were talking about some things. I said, it's time. It's time you serve the Lord. The Bible says, but as many as received him, John 1, 12, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Friends, you know, we make decisions every day. I thank the Lord that you're here. I noticed there's some new people with us today. I thank the Lord that you're here. We make decisions every day. The greatest, greatest, greatest greatest decision that we can ever make is to open up our hearts to the Lord. In Revelations 3.20, the Lord says, Behold, I stand and knock at our heart's door. Only we can do that. And he says, if you open, him, if you open up your heart, I'll come into you. Amen. Bow your head with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I wonder if you're here, you would say, Pastor Tony, would you please pray for me. I want to make that decision. I want the Lord Jesus to come into my heart, to come into my life. What a joy and an opportunity it would be for me to pray with you. If that's you, just slip up your hand. I want to pray with you. Anyone here that would say, please pray for me. 
Yeah, yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand up front here. I see your hand all the way in the, all the, way in the back. Anyone else? I want to pray with you. Yes, God bless you here, sir, to, to my right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Friends, the Lord wants to welcome you. The Lord wants to embrace you. The Lord wants to love on you. He wants to, oh, he, he wants to give you his peace, his joy, his strength, his forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask those of you that raised their hand just to repeat this prayer, and then I'm going to lead out in prayer for you. Uh, you know what? Why don't we all do it to make them all feel comfortable? Those of you that raised your hand, pray this with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your willingness to forgive me, to embrace me, to forgive me, and to restore me. I accept the Lord Jesus into my heart, into my life. Help me to live for you and to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, friends, in this story that Jesus told, he talks about the lost sheep coming back, and he said, heaven rejoices, hallelujah, when the lost sheep are back. Heaven is rejoicing over you today that you responded, hallelujah, that you opened up your heart. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to those that raised their hands. God, I pray that there would be just a joy and a peace and a rest in their hearts and in their lives, that even today, that when they leave this sanctuary, that they would know something has happened. Something on the inside has changed. That there's just a peace about today and about what happened today. God, I pray that you would give them the wherewithal, the resources, a, a Bible, or friends, or family, a church, whatever resources they, they would need to help them to grow and to mature. God, I pray that you would provide it for them, God, we pray. Bless them and empower them to serve you and love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Friends, if you don't have a Bible, I would love to give you a Bible. And there is also a booklet where you go from here. In other words, what, have, what has, has happened to you today? I did this almost 40 years ago at a church right down the road, Gene and I. I raised my hand, came up, got a booklet. I've never been the same since. Hallelujah. <laughs> never been the same since. Praise God. Praise God. Why don't we prepare our hearts for communion? Lord, as we transition into communion, Lord, we thank you for your great sacrifice, which you've done for us. We thank you how you hung on that cross, the humiliation that you faced, and you did it for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless our time as we give thanks and as we for repent of our sins and ask you to cleanse us afresh and anew. Bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, ushers, would you pass out the communion cups, please, and just hold on to the cups. I just want to share a verse of scripture, and I often share this with us. I think it's so appropriate. Uh, it's First John. Uh, Gina, can you open that for me, please? First John 1-7. Uh, John, by the way, John was written to Christians. It was written to you and I. And John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Thanks, babe. From all sin. Hallelujah. What does that mean? It means that the Lord is willing to forgive us and to cleanse us from our sin. And verse 8 of that chapter says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, friends, don't leave with your sin today. 
confess it before the Lord. He's here. He's willing to forgive and to restore and to cleanse you from your sin. Amen. And in verse 9, the Apostle, Paul, Apostle John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that before we partake of communion to examine ourselves, give ourselves a checkup. Have we sinned with our deeds, with our mouth, with our thoughts? with our attitudes. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Let's ask the Lord to help us to overcome those things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and say, said, take, eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your broken body was to make us whole. Make us whole today. Make us whole. Body, mind, and spirit. Do something new and special. Renew us today, God. We need you today. We need you. We need you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sin is never justifiable. We can't blame people or circumstances or jobs. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not the route to go. But it's always forgivable when we repent. Lord, forgive us. We have sinned against you, Lord. There are things that you've asked us, sir to do and we have not done them. Forgive us of those things as well, Lord. Cleanse us afresh and anew. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's partake. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we give thanks to the Lord? Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, you're good. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, let's bless the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, we love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You're a God of restoration, Lord. You're a God of renewal, God. You're a God of forgiveness and pardon, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month or next year. Amen. We are free in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Praise God.